So the next speaker, you'll know him by his voice if you listen to Radio 4, a program called More or Less. You'll know him by his writing, particularly if you read the Financial Times. But he also turns out very informative and engaging best-selling books. Um, the one that I've been reading most recently is Adapt. He's also the undercover economist. Please welcome Tim Harford. Well, didn't the British cycling team do well this year? For those of you who, who haven't been following it, um, sorry. Uh, let me just fill you in. So let's take Olympic track cycling. There was one event in which the British team didn't win a medal. They broke the world record, but they didn't win a medal. They were disqualified on a technicality. The overall count was uh, Great Britain, seven gold medals. The entire rest of the world put together, three gold medals. And I wondered, as I watched this amazing performance, this amazing dominance, what's the secret of the success there? Is there something we could, we could capture and copy? And now we know the secret of their success. The secret of their success is a man called Matt Parker. Matt Parker was the man who emphasised to the British cycling team that Olympic Games are a cauldron of pathogens and you need to really learn to wash your hands carefully. You should never take the official Olympic bus, or always take your own transport. You never know what germs you might bump into. When you travel, Matt Parker emphasised, always bring your favourite pillow with you. Correct sleeping posture is extremely important. You don't want to be carrying any little niggles, any little aches. Matt Parker focused on the golden hour. He realised in the sprint events, there's one hour to recover between the semi-final and the final. And he focused a tremendous amount of attention on recovery time in that hour, the golden hour. And in the sprint events, every British cyclist went faster in the final than in the semi-final, and every non-British cyclist went slower in the final than the semi-final. Matt Parker discovered if you rub alcohol on the wheels of the bike, you clean off just that little tiny layer of dust, of grime, you get a little bit more friction, a little bit more speed out of the starting gate. And of course, Matt Parker invented the hot pants to keep athletes' muscles warm after the warm-up before they actually race. Matt Parker is the head of marginal gains for British cycling. And I love the idea of marginal gains. I love the idea of this incremental improvement. That everything you do, every decision you make, you should be examining. Is there some way to do it a little bit better, and a little bit better, and a little bit better? Because if you put together enough marginal improvements in enough areas, you get something that's truly outstanding. I wish we used marginal gains more, of course, they're catching on uh, in many parts of the technology industry. If you design a website, it's the easiest thing in the world to run an A-B test, to constantly optimise, to constantly check, could we do this a little bit differently, slightly different font, slightly different colour scheme, slightly different placement. And I wish other industries did the same thing, and not just industries. Wouldn't it be amazing if governments applied the philosophy of marginal gains to education, to policing, to prisoner rehabilitation, to the way health services were organised. So I'm very excited about this approach to innovation, a constant focus on ways to do things just a little bit better. But I realised not all innovations involve marginal gains. And that poses a real challenge to the way we organise if we want to innovate. Let me give you an example. In 1931, the British Air Ministry put out a request for new designs for a single-seater fighter aircraft. Now, this was a very strange thing to do for two reasons. One of the reasons is nobody made fighter aircraft back then. There was no point in fighter aircraft. 
There was nothing you could do with fighter aircraft. If you wanted to win an air war, you built bombers. Lots of bombers, more bombers than the other guy, and you hit the other guy's bombers before his bombers hit you. There's no point in having fighters. That was the received wisdom. And second, if you were to have fighters, which you shouldn't, but if you did, obviously, obviously, they would have two crew members in, a pilot and a gunner with a gun turret. So you could fly parallel to what you were trying to hit, you could turn the gun turret, and you could open up. And indeed, a noted parliamentarian gave a speech in the House of Commons saying that it was clearly, utterly insane to commission a single-seater fighter. You had to point the guns forward, the pilot had to fire them, and he had to point the whole plane at what he wanted to shoot at. Insane. Parliamentarian's name, by the way, he was some guy called Winston Churchill. So it was odd. It was odd to commission this kind of fighter plane. And when the replies to this commission came in, when the proposals came in, they sucked. They were terrible, terrible designs, clunky planes, planes that wouldn't work. And then, a little time afterwards, late, months late, from a very unpromising source, a ragtag bunch of engineers on the south coast, run by a man whose chief contribution to public life at that point had been to whip up a frenzy about the idea that there were 50,000 perverts and deviants in the country and they'd all been corrupted by the Kaiser and turned into spies for Germany. This was, so far, this was his public record of achievement, but now he wanted to build a plane. This proposal arrived on the desk of a man called Air Commodore Henry Cave Brown Cave. And with a name like that, you've got to imagine a nice, big, curly moustache. So Air Commodore Henry Cave Brown Cave looked at this proposal to build a plane, to do a job that couldn't be done in a way that was clearly insane, a proposal that arrived late from a bunch of guys who clearly couldn't do it. And Air Commodore Henry Cave Brown Cave said, OK, we'll do this. It will be a most interesting experiment. And that plane was the Supermarine Spitfire, admired throughout the world. Pilots from all across the Commonwealth, from Canada, from Australia, pilots from America, from California, wanted to come to Britain just to fly this beautiful plane. The Germans admired it. There's a tense exchange between Hermann Goering, the head of the Luftwaffe, and Adolf Galland, the German fighter ace. And Goering said, what do you need to win the Battle of Britain? What do you need to defeat the British? And Galland said, spitfires. And you can imagine the tumbleweed blowing through the office at that point. <laughs> the Spitfire was tremendously important in winning the Battle of Britain, in preventing a German invasion of the United Kingdom, in allowing the scientists who worked on the Manhattan Project time to get from the UK to America, in saving the lives of 450,000 Jews who were living in the United Kingdom at that time. It's an exaggeration to say that this is the plane that saved the free world. It's not a big exaggeration. All commissioned for £10,000, the cost of that most interesting experiment by Air Commodore Henry Cave Brown Cave, the price of a nice house in London at the time. Not all innovation is marginal. Not all gains are marginal. And that is a serious problem. If we want to promote innovation, because so often we match the two together. We talk about innovation in this very, very generic way. And we don't recognize the fact that, well, if you're honest, all due respect to Matt Parker, he did a wonderful job. But the guy who is constantly producing marginal gains, week in, week out, can come and say, Look, I quantified it, we've improved it, it's getting better. Give me another week, and another week, and another week. Air Commodore Henry Cave Brown Cave was in an entirely different situation. Now, to give you a sense of the tensions involved, I want to tell you a story of a man called Mario Capecchi. 30 years ago, Mario Capecchi submitted a proposal to the US National Institutes for Health. They're a huge taxpayer-funded body they fund medical innovation. And they're very much set up for the marginal gains business, which is important. Running replications, taking well-explored research strands and pushing them a little bit further. They are spending taxpayers' money 
They want to deliver success after success after success. And what Mario Capecchi was proposing looked to the NIH like science fiction. He was going to take a gene in a mouse genome, remove it, replace it with a different gene. He was going to do all this on a molecular scale. I mean, this is the equivalent of taking one sentence out of an entire library and replacing it on a molecular scale. You are not going to do this with tweezers and a magnifying glass. And this is the early 1980s. And the National Institutes for Health said, well, Mario, it's all very exciting. It's all very ambitious. We're going to give you some money. On no account, spend it on that crazy mouse project. Just keep doing the boring stuff you're doing already. Thank you. And so Mario Capecchi faced a very difficult choice. Because if he, if he pursued his dream of genetically engineering a mouse on the, the single genome level, single gene, if he pursued that, gene, that dream and he failed, and he probably would fail, he had only three years, that was the end of his career. So what to do? What decision did he make? Let me give you a bit of backstory. Mario Capecchi's first memory is that as a child in northern Italy, three and a half years old, the Gestapo knock on the door of his house and they take his mother away to a concentration camp, probably Dachau. And his mother was a political dissident. She knew it was going to happen. She was separated from his father. They never married. So she made provision. Mario was looked after by local villagers for about a year. And then after a year, something happened. We don't know what. He ended up with his father, a very violent man. Capecchi later said, nothing that happened to me was as painful as having a father who was violent towards me. And after just a few weeks, he wasn't yet five years old, he ran away. He became a street urchin for years, the entirety of the Second World War. He ran wild. He was in and out of gangs, in and out of orphanages. He spent a year in a hospital on the verge of death from typhoid. On his ninth birthday, a woman he didn't recognize showed up to collect him from the hospital. And the reason he didn't recognize her was because his mother had changed utterly after spending the war in Dachau and spending a year searching Italy, looking for him. And she took him to the United States, and despite the fact he spoke no English and had been running feral for half his life, Mario quickly caught up, and he ended up at Harvard, working for James Watson, co-discoverer of DNA. And he said to Watson, I want to do molecular biology. I want to achieve great things. Where should I study? Watson said, well, here, Harvard is the center of the molecular biology universe. You'd be effing crazy to go anywhere else. Capecchi had two very productive years at Harvard, and then he left. He set up his own department of molecular biology at the University of Utah, and the reason he left, I think, is fascinating. He said Harvard had become a bastion of short-term intellectual gratification. Too many smart people trying to impress too many other smart people quickly. Too many marginal gains. If you wanted to do really important things, you needed space. And that's why he went to Utah. So having effectively defied his father, Mussolini, and James Watson, who arguably is more frightening than either of them, he's not really going to be intimidated by a bureaucrat from the National Institutes for Health. So he took the money, he spent it on his knockout mouse. He achieved everything he wanted to achieve. He, of course, won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 2007, and a letter from the National Institutes for Health saying, we're very glad that you didn't follow our advice. <laughs> the question I have for all of us is how can we organize for innovation in a way that does not rely on the Mario Capecchi or an, an Air Commodore Henry K. Brown Cave that doesn't rely on this incredible courage or this incredible vision? Is there another way to do it? Because the truth is, while the marginal innovators of the world have a constant track record, the people who keep betting on the long shots, like the Spitfire or the Knockout Mouse, they don't have to succeed every time. I told you the success stories, they usually fail. And when they fail, they're pretty hard to distinguish from the guy who sleeps rough on a park bench. 
Now, it turns out that there is an alternative. To give you one example, there's an organization called the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, which also funds medical research. And unlike the NIH, which does this very important marginal innovation, the National Institutes for Health is absolutely, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute is absolutely determined to fund really big, bold steps. Show us it's never been done before. Show us that there is a substantial chance of failure. And a fascinating study by three economists compared very carefully scientists funded by the National Institutes for Health and scientists funded by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute on, with very similar track records, very similar stages in their careers. And they found, if you want to guarantee those marginal gains, if you want every project, every innovation to succeed, do it the way the National Institutes for Health do it. It will work. But if you want to create research papers that are in the top 1% most cited, the ones that really make a difference, win prizes, create new, whole new genres of scientific research, whole new areas of scientific research. You've got to embrace the risk of failure. You've got to take a few long shots. You've got to fund it the way the Howard Hughes Medical Institute funds it. Both areas of innovation are vital. Marginal improvement is all about climbing the hill you're on and punting on these long shots. It's all about finding new mountains to conquer. The Howard Hughes Medical Institute and the National Institutes for Health are both wonderful examples to us. But I couldn't help noticing Howard Hughes Medical Institute are very proud of one of their principal investigators. His name is Mario Capecchi. Thank you very much.